Hi, welcome to episode 18 of Data Mesh TV. Today, I'm really happy to have Luis Cruz, Luis Huertas, as you can see in the title there, on the call today. He's the executive director, the head of automation, infrastructure, big data, AI, and analytics. Long title, a lot of work, really exciting work over at DBS. I had a chance to meet uh, Luis just a couple months ago in Singapore. And I, I were walking away from the meeting thinking, wow, this is one of the most innovative uh, IT designs, data mesh designs, data platform designs that I had seen. Uh, and still to this day, I go back to that, you know, the, the notes in my head, so to speak. Uh, there was so much innovation. I couldn't take any notes on paper, but I, I was just very impressed by what they were doing, how they were doing it, and a lot of the ideas that Luis had. And so at the time, I said, I got to get him on the show. It's taken a while for us to come back around, but I'm really excited to have him today to kind of talk with me and talk with you about some of the exciting things they're doing at EBS. Uh, Luis, welcome to the show. Hi, hi, and welcome. Happy to be here. <laughs> Fantastic. I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss a quote at you because I, I was watching some old videos. Um, and you, you had a comment. You said, I think you said, I, I'm turning data scientists into data engineers. And, I, and that's, I sat back, I said, wow, I've heard, I think people are trying to do the opposite, engineering and science. You're like, no, I'm hiring data scientists and I'm turning them into data engineers. And I, I, I thought that was awesome. I don't have enough of, e of either one, but I, I, that makes a lot of sense to me because when I look at what you're doing, it is so innovative. It's got to be led by these big data, these big brains, right? So I need data science brains for my data engineers. And that's the way I, I heard it. But what, what do you mean by that when you say that? Um, sure. So, I mean, the, the core principle is as, as, as you actually move to a more open systems, right? Um, the good thing about enterprise product is that it's highly coupled with, you know, extensive investigation and UI and user interaction. So basically anybody can come in and do, right? And now when you move actually to the open source world, there's a little bit of a less friendliness on that side. And there is a little bit of more, um, there's actually not a little bit, there is actually more uh, ground -break work, um, groundbreaking work on like code and different things like this. Um, when we talk about what data scientists face today with the different tooling out there, right? Whether it's Jupyter Notebooks, et cetera, um, you know, most of the time the data science profession in general is, you know, uh, has been trained and fine tuned on applications like R and Python, um, but they've really had very little experience on data platform, running their queries on a data platform. And that basically means, you know, now instead of running uh, a job in your computer on a Pandas, now you're actually phasing to running your jobs on Spark, for example, uh, you know, parallel computing segmenting the jobs in, in, in multi-processing. So when we talk about turning data scientists into data engineers, right, is, you know, data scientists now actually need to have a higher level of knowledge on how the piping actually works, right? Mm -hmm. Now is not only riding the train, but knowing how the train tracks are actually built. So you mm -hmm. can run the train efficiently, right? Um, and it's that precise, you know, like, uh, you know, thing about, I, I don't know if there's some fans of racing out there, but you know, uh, there is this famous Ferrari driver that was called Niki Lauda. And uh, Niki Lauda was basically an expert in fine tuning the car. And that what, that's what used to make him great because he truly understand how the car worked, right? And he can exploit the top capabilities of what the car can provide. Data scientists are no different than that. If they understand the platform they're running to the core, right, the way they write their queries and their jobs can be highly fine tuned and optimized, right? You, we're talking jobs that can run from eight hours to 45 minutes, jobs that used to run in 18 hours can run in one hour, right? Just by knowing exactly how the piping actually works, right? So, um, you know, we've been working exhaustively to, to create a concept of what we call uh, system performance engineers, right? And system performance engineers, SPEs are, again, it's either a data scientist turned into a data engineer or a data engineer turned into a data scientist, but they need to have both knowledges, right? And they need to converge on that, right? Uh, the ability to analyze code on the spot, the ability to read code on the spot, 
and turn that into recommendations on how to optimize and tune the queries. Um, the very basic principle of a senior of a system performance engineer is you don't do anything that isn't measured at the start, right? So we measure where we're starting, and then we we start optimizing, then we measure every single time again and again and again, and we can see the immediate effect that it's having. But this is again because they have the domain knowledge of both worlds. Love it. I, I, I love that you're practicing what we preach. You're using data to drive your performance. And uh, I'm going to have to look up Mickey Lara, right? He was the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Innovator, the, first, the first SPE, <laughs> right? He didn't even know it. But he was the first SPE. Sweet. Sweet. I mean, it, it, no, no, we're, N Mickey Lara is a, it's, it's an ex driver for Ferrari that used to consume data a lot and basically consume all the details of the car he was driving and use that to improve. Right? Yeah. And the, the concepts for us are no different than that, right? I mean, the more data we can use to improve the jobs we're running and how we're running the queries and how we're building it from the start, right? It just basically enhances the overall experience and the performance that we want to obtain out of the things that we're actually running. So right. it's the very core principle of that, yeah. Love it, love it. I um, let's let's jump into that innovation <laughs> side a, a bit. The and you also mentioned open source. You are committed to to open source. I remember looking at your architecture, um, and it felt like top to bottom it was it was open source. Um, and you have the data scientists and the engineers to drive that. Uh, and, and and that gives you a lot of flexibility, a lot of fast innovation. Um, using kind of the greatest and and, and best tools, so to speak, to kind of go out there and drive. I don't want, I know we probably can't go into, into a lot of detail for some of the really advanced things that you're doing, but I remember we talked about virtual engineers, right? And you used the word automation a second ago. That's part of your title. Your job is to measure and then to automate and you use virtual engineers to do that. Um, we, we also talked about, and you, you didn't show it to me, but you, you, you talked about in, in some detail, this concept of a digital twin for IT. I um, mean, how you think you had used graph to, to kind of build those out and so forth. And that was super impressive. And I think when yeah. you sit back and you're trying to run and not only run, but operate with some level of great efficiency, you have to automate. And when you, this digital twin concept, virtual engineering concept, those are automative techniques that you've built to kind of run the back, the, the bank more efficiently on the back end. I don't, again, I don't want to, you know, talk in anything that might be too uh, competitive or um, secret, so to speak, but this is just, is this just the way you run your whole IT shop? I mean, on those principles of measurement and automation? Yeah, um, we, we, we've institutionalized, you know, behavior in a way that um, we've classified the work we do in two categories. Let's say category one is non-deterministic. Category two is deterministic. Okay. Non-deterministic is repetitional work, right? How much work do we actually do that is repetitive um, to the core, right? Basically, you know, every now and then a job gets stuck. We got to go into the console. We got to restart the job and we got need to do that. Every now and then, you know, the, is a database getting full that we need to clean that database up, right? And we kind of start classifying with through data how much of this is actually happening, right? Then we basically say, okay, you know, there's two, two choices. Either we invest all of our time fixing it, which that might take you some time, right? Um, whether it's version upgrades, whether there's new releases on the software that is going to come, whether the software has a deficiency on its own um, that cannot be remediated at the moment, right? Um, let's say, I don't know, like some versions of Spark support up to certain version of Python, right? And after that, if you have higher versions of Python, you cannot run it on that Spark version, right? So there are some limitations on that. So the question was, what is the what is it that known knowns we know that we need to do that have high rep volumes of repetition and then what we actually need to automate right automate we when we say automation there's different sorts of automation 
right? They could be provisioning automation, but there's also incident remediation automation. Um, there's different sort of automation that we actually need to apply to run the, the platform efficiently, right? And um, so that, that basically took us to what I say step one, which is, you know, I need to know what I have. Right. Create the right framework for telemetry, right? And that framework for telemetry has to be not in the way you're thinking about it, which is, you know, let's select the right tool. The fact is organizations today have invested massive amount of millions of dollars in telemetry systems, right? We, instead of looking at the tools, we didn't touch the tools. We came up with a framework of putting an open source agent on the edge that is open enough that can send information to either of the tools that the institution has bought. But at the same time, we can capture from the application stack or the infrastructure stack, the same matrices on another, let's say, uh, um, you know, telemetry system, whether it's real time series DBs versus logging DBs, et cetera, right? Um, so what we were saying is we can rip and replace the tool that's capturing but then the agent doesn't need to change, right? Right? It's universally, uh, you know, accepted by the industry in general. So we focus on that, and um, so we've we've started building our own telemetry. Uh, um, let's say it's not a data lake, right? It's a combination of specific built for purpose databases. Why? Because telemetry is not structured in general. All the systems spit out error logs and error messages in different ways, in different formats. So you got logging systems, you got real-time series databases that can store, you got historical uh, playgrounds that you can actually use. But once you have all of that, um, you can do a lot of analytics on top and come up with, you know, identifying the most common error codes and all of these. But that doesn't give you much other than a better mechanism to troubleshoot. Um, so that's when we started exploring, um, you know, can we actually build, rather than building correlation of incidents, can we actually build a correlation of what the platform is actually running inside? So meaning like if I run a job, you know, if I have jobs A, B, C, and D, and A, B, C, and D need to run simultaneously and let's say complete their batch processing by 9 a.m. There is a hierarchy job said that is that requires A, B, C, and D to finish. So there is that one-to-many relationship, and then there's that many-to-many -many relationship across the jobs in the spectrum. So we said, okay. For us to guarantee the success of this job, that is basically the big one, right? All of these situations need to happen at the same time. How do we track how we measure it? And tracking and measure it was one. And then the second, the third question was how do we remediate it in order for it to prevent failure? So this is how things actually, you know, Adrian, get entangled. Yeah. First and foremost is if the big job needs to finish in the same day, if the answer is yes, then that means the higher, the, 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 all the jobs that co-depend with the big one need to have the possibility to run more than one time in case they fail within the same day. So if, the, if one of those jobs, let's say job A takes 14 hours, that's unacceptable. Why? Because if it fails, there's no chance for the end-to-end -end job to conclude, right? Right? Because it just consumed 18 hours of the day, right? Yeah. So if the performance engineering team that we just talked about can reduce that time to two hours, you have a chance. Right? Yeah. Now I gave the big job a chance and an opportunity. Now the yeah. second answer is build an automation in that instead of waiting for it to fail, because we already know it's going to fail, call it and restart it. You know, it's what I find so interesting about the innovation and the automation that you're doing is I, 
Sometimes we have these conversations as engineers uh, or data scientists about the, the, this IT vision that we have, the, these great things we want to build. Uh, I've been called a hobbyist uh, early in my career. It's like, uh, you're just trying to build a wall of shiny lights, right? Focus on what the, what the company needs. Uh, and oftentimes we, we get carried away with the shiny lights. But when I listen to you talk and I look at the way you've applied them, there's, um, there's no waste in there, right? You're not building things for the sake of building them. You're very practical in your approach and you're focused on the things that, that the bank needs. When, when we talked about data mesh, uh, there was another quote that I remember I walked away with. You, you said, and whether we're talking data mesh or, or data fabric or any of the frameworks that are out there, I think you had a nice row of O'Reilly books on your shelf there with a space for your future O'Reilly book. But I think you said something effective. You, you, you take the, the concepts and the capabilities that you need right now. You're not going out there to build a mesh just to build a mesh. You're going out there and you're like, hey, I really like this concept of products. I mean, I really like this concept of, of autonomy. I really like this concept of self-service. So when you design your data platform, you focus on the capabilities that your company needed right now with room to grow as you needed heavily, heavily. And, and what, you know, somebody says, well, what's different from what they're building I would say it's the automation. What's, what jumps out at you when you look at their mesh design, it's the end-to-end -end automation. And that gives you an incredible amount of efficiency. Uh, earlier, you also said sometimes people focus on the design or they focus on some other concepts, but they forget that you've got to run and operate. That automation gives you incredible capabilities or incredible efficiency when you get ready to run and operate. Let, let, let's dig into some of that um, because you... You're not a small organization. I, I can't remember what the numbers were, but I'm, there's huge volumes of analytics that you're dealing with on a daily basis. And as you described a second ago, these aren't small jobs, right? Some of them are really big jobs. You're trying to create more efficiency around. Let's talk about your, your data platform. And I've heard that you, we, we've used a couple of different words to describe some of the things you're doing. Um, I want to kind of pull it back a little bit and think about that data platform uh, holistically and, and then let's 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 look let's start with the lake right because i know you have lakes and, and lake houses and a lot of warehouses a, a little bit of everything so to speak is that right when you think about your your enterprise lake platform you're dealing with a lot of different back-end sources transactional systems where maybe you have to con connect you directly or not and then you have lakes and and how do you manage it how do you how do you draw that picture uh, that says I, these are all the back-end sources that i have and then let's talk a little bit about how you manage that, right? How maybe I think Trino, you, you guys are so heavily committed to Trino, how that kind of helps you kind of federate across all those sources. Yeah, so so the downstream sources, um, which are basically the data is, I start with the principle that the data is owned and generated by um, any business unit. They're, they're the ones owning it, right? Okay. They're the ones that have the downstream systems, whether, you know, uh, you name it, whatever they are, it could be SAP or whatever that downstream system is, is generating some levels of huge amounts of volumes of data. Um, the first step is, is that ingestion mechanism. And, and, and for example, how we deviate from the concepts of data mesh in a way is that we don't have that. Uh, uh, th there is a data architecture of you, you data architect by domain, or you can data architect by function, right? right? So those are some key principles that are out there, right? But, and that's basically how some metadata tools are defined also, right? So you can, you can, you can create a domain, which is basically the domain could be like, like, like a condo. And then, you know, the, the rooms inside the condo can be, you know, can have different or can serve different purposes of how people decide to accommodate the house inside, right? Um, the ingestion is the ingestion framework. And, you know, that, that was engineered by a, a lot of very smart people here in the bank, um, is, you know, that entry point that, uh, simplifies the mechanism of bringing data from the downstream version into layer one of the data platform, right? Then the data platform finds a way to accommodate that, right? Basically, you know, it's a per country, per business unit, et cetera, and provide a definition of, of how that, that data object is actually read and interpreted, right? Um, once you have that um, done, which is basically that definition of that framework of how you ingest data, um, 
basically, you know, it comes down to ownership of the data, right? Fine grained access control on how you define your, you know, your data security framework and who has access to what, right? Who are the data owners, which is all parts of core principles that have existed in, you know, prior MDM and that evolved into, you know, data lakes and data warehousing, how this was actually done. And that evolved into, uh, you know, data mesh and that, you know, that has procrastinated to way more names like lake houses and all these different things. But ultimately, fine access, fine access control to the data gives control of data ownership. You can control your own data products if you want to say that or feature marts or and, and, and then you basically uh, provide a data, data governance team that basically becomes, um, let's say, in a way that data governance team is a guider, not an implementer. Right. And then you can apply, for example, who says that I need decentralized data governance? Who says that I need centralized data governance? Maybe actually you need a blend. Right. Maybe you need a central govern data governance team that gives orientation to everybody. Yeah. And then you yeah. delegate that to yeah. decentralized teams to enforce and implement. Yeah. Right. Um, it's then again, that's another concept of how you're actually applying multiple you know, let's say, uh, uh, you know, methodologies that are out there that are being presented as the one to do, right? So for us, again, it's that principle of let's just grab the pieces that actually work, right? Right. Let's just let's just focus on that, and if we focus on that, um, we don't need to deal with we we would deal with certain amount of cultural change, but not that much, mm -hmm. right? The technical challenges could be reduced to a certain extent. Um, and, and, and then, of course, I mean, you know, all those different nuances you're talking about, we ingest, we have commonality on a data lake, but then, you know, the data lake is not there for Trino just to query the data lake, right? What we want is to generate value out of data. And to generate a value out of data, you need to be able to create, you know, uh, basically combinations of different data elements creating and, and let's let's blow away concepts let's create new data sets that's what it is in reality right, right. i'm combining a downstream version from a source into a readable format that is universally understand and now i can, can combine different data sets together and create a new data set that is relevant to yep. basically build another product and i can combine now downstream uh, you know, recently ingested data with a data, data, a new data set that I've created. And now that I've combined the two, I can create a new feature that that feature, it's a money generator. I, I, it, it doesn't need to be too complicated, right? Nope. If we simplify all those terms and basically put it in the groundbreaking work of what, what it is, is if I want to run a hierarchy machine learning model on top, right? Cool. What are the key data sets that I need? And do I, how do I build these data sets that are required, yeah. right? And how these data sets keep flowing operationally every day, hydrating new data, refreshing the data, data coming in, being ingested, being appended every day. Um, and if you just focus on that, yeah, right, that basically gives you the right tooling and opportunity of what you actually need in the end, right? Which is, okay, you, you, you start bringing way more concepts, data quality, and all these different things, right? Um, you know, in reality, if you look at it, um, you know, I don't know how much time I invested in the data space, but I, I heard I heard conversations for the past five years before, you know, from 20, 2015 to 2020, everybody was talking about explainable AI. Every, that was the buzzword. <laughs> and then some genius came in um, and basically created something for deep learning called Chain of Thoughts. Oh. And then basically explainable AI died. Ask, somebody said something as simple as, ask the model to explain how it derived what it, what it, what it generated, <laughs> creating a chain of thought. Um, I think all these are permutations of the evolution of what we have. But if you take all of that in, inject it into 
into, into the principles of where you're doing in the enterprise, you always need to come down to the simplicity of saying, what is it that we actually really, really need? And a lot of this is what the open source world, to me, it solves, right? It just provides very basic tooling, groundbreaking tooling and pipelining that you can just use and customize in a highway to address the pain point. Um, we use to have a lot of tools that use to do SQL query language, but we can cover that with uh, tools like Trino, for example, right? Um, yeah. With Trino, we can just cover that and say, you know, we have a tool where we can do this. It's not as simple as what you have, but it does do the work and it does way much more, right? Okay. Than what you used to have or need. So, so by leveraging, you know, different tools, components like that, evaluating, evaluating, and then of course, you know, I cannot say there's a level of adoption, there is, right? But the, the question is on the commitment side, how much are we committed to enable and actually, you're doing people a favor. You're making them right. smarter, right? Yeah. Um, in the end, you're, you're basically making people smarter, right? Um, if, if you teach them how to do Trino, um, they're in a way, you know, doing SQL, yes. Are they learning Python? Yes. Are they learning coding skills? Yes. I, you know, and, and if they learn these tools, now they can apply their domain knowledge yeah. in, in, a, in a huge variety of ways, right? which sorry to say and this is just my personal opinion where low code no code things don't don't give that to you it's a limited variation and combination um so you know it just exploits you know the, the opportunity that, that i think that self-service capability um that that's the key right and I, I don't know that everybody gets there overnight and to be fair you look at enterprises, even large mesh designs, they're, you know, and I think whether you use a domain or not, I don't think in DBS we've adopted the concept of domains yet. Uh, certainly adopted the concept of data products. But when you start looking at different groups, there are some domains or some teams that are all in on self-service, self -service, right? They want, to, they want to be data scientists and engineers because they can be, right? They want to know how the tracks were laid out. And then you have other teams that are like, whoa, yeah, I, I, more hands offish, right? Um, maybe some business teams that say, I love being able to get my own data product. It's already been built. I'm not ready to build my own. And I think that's okay. I think different parts of the company are ready to adopt and embrace that autonomy and that self-service kind of at different speeds. Fine, right? Let, let's be practical about how we do that. I want to come back to ingestion for a second because that's we get, there's a, it's a hot topic for discussion. I think a lot of us still struggle with ingestion. We, we talked a little, you, we, you made it sound really easy, <laughs> but it's not right. And uh, the ingestion part is, is, is kind of the, 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 it's the part people struggle with the most, right? And it, it takes a long time. If we, if we think about ingestion, you're thinking about migration or you're thinking about having to transform a lot of data to get it into the right structure in a warehouse or something. Uh, and that might be the right solution in some cases. You're talking about saying, hey, look, where I've got data in the lake um, and where the metadata is right, I'm going to hit it. Um, where I can't put that data in a lake, I'm going to federate it. Um, and that allows you the flexibility to enable MI teams, AI teams, and dashboard teams, application teams. You're almost able to get, it gives you the flexibility to deliver to a lot of different types of consumers in different ways. That's that's what I heard. Let me make sure that that's, that's yeah. going with it. So, so I'll try to to be to summarize some of this into a context, right? What does the data ingestion framework actually helps you on? I think it only helps you predominantly in four things. Okay. You have a large complex environment. Um, when you have a data ingestion framework, you're automating the ingestion of data from a large variety of sources. Principle number one, right? Principle number two, it helps you validate the data as is it it's being ingested, right? The framework should help you validate the data as it's being ingested. Principle number three, you know, you can transform the data into a format that is ready for analysis, right? Now, principle four is, you know, you can now load that data into 
whether it's a data warehouse or a data lake, it doesn't matter. That now you can load it. Now you can monitor, as this, the fifth principle, you can actually monitor the entire ingestion process for errors and performance issues on the loading of the data, right? Now, out of that, if you're able to just quantify what I just defined, you can get ex huge benefits on efficiency, quality, security, because now you can, you know, basically, when the when you when I say improve security is because by providing a centralized location for the data ingestion framework to go, right? Uh, features like data encryption, access control, all of these is highly facilitated, right? Now I'm dealing with one ingestion, one encryption, one access control framework versus dealing with three, four, five, six, or seven different ones, right? So if, if you get it right, when you, you automate ingestion, you validate it, um, you know, you transform the data into a readable format that's ready for analysis. All of these basically are key defined principles of data of, of why that, you know, framework is actually required. Um, some of the practices that I can just mention, uh, and, you know, my head is exploding right now on a, on a large set of ideas, but um, uh, the data ingestion process needs also to you combine data quality frameworks, right? How you're ingesting, how you're evaluating, how you're assessing that the data is good. Um, you know, uh, can you use data transformational frameworks for that? Uh, because it's whether the, the data needs to be transformed. Um, yes, it's highly applicable. That, that contains the cleansing, the normalization, the aggregation of data. All of these principles are part of that. So again, for me, the entry point of defining as an end institution, whether we need a data ingestion framework or not, is first is very in, answer a very simple question. How many data sources will we have? And if it's extremely large, then you would, the answer would be yes. If you're dealing with one or two, you might not need to do all this stuff because things will, will be practically easier, right? You're just dealing with two sources of data. But if you, it's high, then yes, you actually do need it, right? And that's going to help you. I think the biggest one is to transform the data into a format ready information that is ready for analysis, right? That's where everybody has the biggest pain, right? Is that all oh, data is not ready. It's not readable, that format. We need to transform it. We need to cleanse it, all this stuff. But if you have a data ingestion framework that can take care of all that for you, yeah. then basically, you know, if you're a data scientist, that's music to your ears. It's data that's ready, ready, readily available already to analyze. Love it. Love it. We're never enough time on the on these conversations, but Close that up, I think, is if you have the right, if you build and design the right fit for purpose, fit for purpose, depending on what you look like, where you are, data ingestion framework, now you're able to help your data scientists and your business analysts really understand the way those data pipelines, those data tracks were laid out. And if they understand where the data comes from, if they trust the data that's on the track, so to speak, and they understand how to get to the data, then they can drive really, really fast Ferraris like Nikki Lada because they can go as fast as they want to because they understand the guide rails. They understand how to slow down and they understand when to turn. So um, bringing all your yeah. analogies together kind of into one concept, but really appreciate it, Luis. I, we're, we're a little bit over time now and, and I, we didn't get a chance to kind of talk about everything that I wanted to because it's it is really exciting. And uh, for, for another kind of, you know, for a CDO to look at what you're doing, it's just really, really impressive. So I hope we stay connected. Can't wait to see what you guys build next with your automation. But uh, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. De definitely, uh, we can talk. Uh, we can we can uh, have another session to 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 show how what we've built actually has allowed us to you know do very very fast innovation yeah. on how we could flexibly we, we can we can turn the platform that we built that was doing traditional ML and we uh, you know very fast adapted to the new world of gen AI bringing large language models supporting that hosting them training them fine-tuning them connecting to different apis 
all this stuff we've been able to do because the platform has been had, had enough flexibility inside to you know basically manage and sustain models like that which is quite, quite a fascinating thing so yeah we can talk about that i think that comment in a year in two years looking back on this episode what you just said there the flexibility of the platform to be able to react and adapt and serve ai is is powerful right and i, I don't yeah. know that we a lot of us don't appreciate that yet but i think we're starting to <laughs> so thank you so much please have right. a great evening in singapore i'll have a good morning here yeah. in Houston. thank you all right all right appreciate it thank sure. you bye